broadcasting live from the School of Athens. This is Europe and the People Without History with Mr. Olson, everyone's favorite AP World History Review Service. So we're going to dip back in time a little bit and talk about that civilization that kicked off the classical era and focusing on the ancient Greeks for this rendition of our civilization series. The ancient Greeks were around between 600 BCE and 600 CE, which makes them a classical civilization. Now, let's first get out of the way some myths about ancient Greece. First of all, they were democratic. Sometimes, maybe, kind of, maybe not. Eh, depends on how you look at it, but that's history for, for you. They were egalitarian. Not so much. They were nice. Ask the Melians, a Spartan colony that Athens absolutely slaughtered all the men in and enslaved all the women's in, women in during the Peloponnesian Wars. They were all Athenians. They were, in fact, not Athenians. Just look at the fact that most of you probably know about Sparta just as much as you know about Athens. And finally, they had all the answers. What to do with women? Aristotle thought, put them in the kitchen. They did not have all the answers. Now, should we be giving kudos to ancient Greece? Well, here's an interesting Marxist perspective that comes from a prominent historian Ellen Meekson's Wood, Wood, who wrote, while disputes still rage about the extent and function of slavery, slavery scholarly opinion is all but unanimous in the view that many Greek citizens, and more particularly the majority in the most culturally vigorous polis, Athens, worked for a living as peasants, craftsmen, and even casual laborers. Yet, this laboring citizenry, which has no known precedent and arguably no later parallel, has somehow never achieved quite the same status as a distinctive essential, or determinative feature which has so often been accorded to slavery in the explanation of Greek culture. What she's saying there is historians love to focus on the fact that Athens had a lot of slaves, but Athens also had a robust and thriving working class, which is perhaps something that allowed their democracy to be something worth celebrating. I don't necessarily agree with her wholly on this one, but she does have a point. A lot of people in Athens were workers but also a lot were slaves. All right, so before we kick this off, let's make a note on city-states. As you, you can see in that map there, Greece was very divided, much because of its geography, but we'll get to that in a second. Nevertheless, it was hard to politically unify Greece. As a result, you got a lot of city-states. Now, it's interesting to note that Greek history happens over a long period of time, and even though we like to think of Greek history as only being those city-states, if you look at what happened later on, Alexander made an empire. So we're talking about that whole period, the disunified city-states, all the way to Alexander's empire. All right, let's kick this off. We're going to follow things along with the, uh, the famous spice chart. So you can follow along with any sort of blank spice chart you have. Let's start with the social. All right, so city-states were relatively homogenous in terms of their ethnicities, which means most Greek people looked the same. There might have been some uh, people that had mi migrated or were brought as slaves from Africa, but for the most part, they would look probably like modern-day Greeks do. Slavery was widely practiced in Athens. Now, this wasn't chattel slavery based upon melanin in skin. This was basically political prisoners, people that owed money, prisoners of war, things like that. But it's important to note that Athens, the supposedly egalitarian, wonderful city-state, had slaves, and so did Sparta. In fact, Spart Spartan slaves were known as helots, and a helot would have to die in order for a Spartan boy to gain the rite of passage, which means a Spartan boy had to search out a helot, kill it, and prove that they killed it without being caught in order to become a Spartan warrior. That, my friends, is horrifying. All right, in terms of gender roles, well, that varied among city-states. Remember, there's a lot of disconnected city-states politically at this time, and not all of them are going to be the same. So take, for example, the fact that Athenian women were seen as inferior beings relegated to lesser roles. This is literally proposed by Aristotle in some stupid work that he wrote. I hate Aristotle, and so you will hear me ragging about how Aristotle did relatively little for the advancement of human thought. Women in the kitchen, according to Aristotle. Wrong. Now, we'll go over the water a little bit and go to Sparta, where women were actually celebrated and held exalted statuses in society. They could own property. They were expected to stay physically fit because of... As the story goes, a physically fit mother is more able to have physically fit kids, which of course is what the Spartans wanted, particularly physically fit warrior males. But women were not secluded to the home because Spartans saw, saw that as bad for their development. In fact, if you were to take a quote from the time period, that says 
why are you Spartan women the only ones who can rule men? And the queen of Sparta, they had a queen, go figure, shows how uh, much more egalitarian toward women they were than the Athenians, said, because we are also the only ones who give birth to men. Which really highlights the fact that Spartan women exalted status. All right, continuing with the social, let's talk about the high hierarchy. Uh, particularly in Athens, um, there was a social hierarchy based upon class and based upon how someone went about making a living. You'll see there that there was a, a small group of aristocrats at the top. These would have been merchants, they could have been uh, artisans, they could have been people uh, that were landed aristocracy, which means that they were born into a, a large land landowning and families. Below them were farmers, then farmers that rented, women and kids uh, near the bottom, and then resident aliens or people who had migrated to Athens and were kind of like staying there, bumming around, and foreigners, and then you had slaves at the bottom. All those people in the red and down were not able to vote on the regular. Maybe sometimes, but not often. Which means, was Athens truly a democracy? No. Now, po politically, let's talk about that democracy. Early on in this area of the world, which is pictured in that map to the right in the Aegean Sea, which is in the larger Mediterranean, uh, there were grandfather civilizations to the Greeks called uh, Crete and the Mycenae. So you will see that uh, the island of Crete uh, is pictured there, and then uh, that little black dot where the Mycenae were. So these are two civ civilizations that were around. Um, the Minoans particularly were uh, on the island of Crete. Um, they left behind relics, artifacts, particularly buildings that had columns that you will come to see later on in this very presentation. Nevertheless, over time, uh, these early civilizations kind of fizzled out, and that gave uh, rise to the more well-known Greek city-state civilization that we celebrate today. So they were organized, as I said time and time again, by the polis or the city-state, and in each city-state there was different political styles. Some had monarchies, some had oligarchies, some were ruled by the military, some were, quote, democratic. Um, but it really depended on where you were. Now, the most famous of the city-states were Spartans and Athens. Sparta and Athens. All right, so Sparta emphasized warrior men, and they emphasized being tough and being warlike and celebrated that to, to the T. Women ran the household but were allowed freedoms that we talked about before. In Athens, on the other hand, this emerged out of... Uh, several people in the society resenting the power that merchants had, so they wanted to more equally disperse power among well-endowed people, just not the merchants. Since Greece is a bunch of islands and they have a uh, vast sea presence, obviously merchants can uh, you know, get their way more than other people. So they started giving, uh, basing citizenship not on one's ability to be a good merchant, but on land-owning. So therefore, land-owning citizens were able to vote. They were also able to recall their leaders, which means that if you were one of the elected leaders, you could uh, be recalled by the people that voted, which means you had to do a good job. You were sort of, um, you know, you, they, you were beholden to their interests. All right, so now after Greece and Sparta have a civil war, which we'll get to in a second, it cripples the city-state system and Macedonia, or this kingdom, north of the Greek Isles, right there, uh, take, takes over. So Philip II uh, reigns first, and then he is killed in a very interesting situation by his bodyguard. Supposedly Alexander the Great hired the bodyguard to kill his daddy. I don't know. But then Alexander the Great takes over. Now, this is just a side, side note, but calling somebody great doesn't necessarily mean that they are great. Okay, Alexander the Great takes over around 336 BCE, and he expands the borders into what you will see in this map here, all the way from the Greek Isles to the Indus River, which I'm now realizing is a little bit cut off, but use your imagination. Anyways, he consolidated Greece into an empire. And even though he only ruled for 13 years and died of a fever because he was kind of a simpleton, uh, he still vastly expanded the borders, took over Egypt all the way to the Indus River Valley. Okay, now after his death, his empire was split into several different kingdoms, and that allowed or that allowed for squ squabbling, and then eventually is taken over by Rome. So if you were to, to look at this map, you will see uh, this is his empire after Alexander dies, and you will note that all the different colors don't mean cohesion. So as a result of that, 
things fall apart and leaving them uh, at bay for the Romans to come in and take over. Okay, so now interaction. Let's talk first about interaction with the environment and the geography of this place. I've sort of already alluded to it, uh, so this should, should be easy. There were many small islands that led to the formation of city-states. There was a mainland peninsula, but its existence prioritized the use of the water. So people living in and around Greece became very, very good at seafaring. Now, they benefited from the ongoing influence of the Phoenicians in this part of the world. That shouldn't surprise you because the Phoenicians are well known for providing uh, an, an alphabet, which the Greeks adopted. And if you go look at the Greek letter alpha and the Phoenician letter A, you will see that they are very similar. Greeks then, uh, over time, developed you know use of or good use of seafaring, and uh, eventually started to build massive boats called triremes, which literally would bar barge into another boat and split it in half. Okay, but if you were to look at this boat here and the boat of a Phoenician uh, warship, they look very, very similar. Okay, so now let's talk about interactions with each other. As I said earlier, Greece, while known for its democracy, was also kind of violent. The first ma major war that the Greeks are involved in is the Persian Wars, and it sort of uh, allows for the ashes out of which uh, the Greeks can rise. Persia wanted to expand, Greece didn't want them to, and ultimately Greece is going to is going to prevail. Three battles occur that you might have heard about but are not worth knowing. Battle of Marathon where some dude runs 26.2 miles to let them know that the Persians are coming. Greeks win that one. Battle of Thermopylae which is one where uh, the historian Herodotus supposedly said that 300 Spartan warriors fought 5 million Persians. Total lie. Classic example of historical bias. Nevertheless the Persians win that one. But eventually the war is uh, the, the war's fate is sealed at the Battle of Salamis where the Greeks have a, a victory uh, in the water because they're so much better at boating and the Persians aren't really that good at, at, at it then. Now after the Battle of Thermopylae when it looks like the Persians might actually win this war they actually make their way all the way to Athens and burn Athens down. That's why the famed uh, statue of Athena not there. Okay. Uh, however, after that, several Greek city-states realized, hey, if we put our differences aside, we might actually be able to beat the Greeks, or I'm sorry, beat the Persians. And that's why they come together in an alliance known as the Delian League. Eventually, these Persian wars brought about the decline of Persia for several reasons that you can find in the Persia video. All right. Now, the other war that took place occurred after the per Persian Wars, when now that Greece was sort of an autonomous place without a threat from an outsider, they started to squabble internally. And so the Peloponnesian Wars, which are fought for roughly a 27-year time period between 431 and 403 BC, pits Athens against Sparta. And it's a battle over land and resources and really ideology. What type of society uh, do we want to have? Sparta wins. Now they win because, you know, they're warriors and they're, you know, they've built such tough and humble uh, young people. They used to hold the babies over the cliff and if the baby cried while being held, then it got let go, supposedly. I don't know if that's true. But anyways, there was also a massive plague. I'm filming this during the COVID epidemic, so it's uh, quite... Timely. There's also a plague in Athens between the years 430 and 426 BCE, right when the war starts. It sort of cripples Athens a little bit and allows for Sparta to win. Anyways, this seals the, the, the fate of the city-state system and says, eh, it's not really going to work. And that allows for Philip II of Macedon to come in and take, take over. The city-state system really can only work if all the city-states get along. All right, and now probably the most important and well-known aspect of the Greek civilization, their culture. Now, Greece had itself a golden age that occurred between the years 461 and 429 BCE that roughly coincided with the reign of Pericles. Now, the funny thing about golden ages is that one person's golden age might be somebody else's dark age. So calling it a golden age, we really have to be specific to the civilization we're talking about. Anyways, when we speak of a golden age, we're talking about a high point of cultural achievement. This is when Greek philosophy was at its height. Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, not in that order. Greek entertainment, plays, tragedies, comedies, um, including uh, stuff done by Sophocles and Aristophanes. Greek intellectual achievement, Herodotus writing history, Ptolemy getting astronomy wrong, Pythagoras and Euclid coming up with mathematical equations and ideas that will torture 
uh, geometry students for the rest of their life. Vomit. Okay, you get the point. So anyways, uh, Greece is... Uh, a, Greece undergoes this massive cultural flourishing. Now, part of the reason it does that is because the Persian Wars are over and there's no threat from the outside. You'll see that Greece's golden age ends right when the Peloponnesian Wars begin. So let that be a lesson to you. Golden ages don't coincide with wars. Greek religion. Um, I really don't feel like I need to lecture all the Percy Jackson fans out there, uh, but if you look to Greek mythology... You sort of get the idea of Greek religion. It was polytheistic, and that's pretty much all we need to know about that. All right, more on, on their culture. This golden age saw the um, flourishing of art and architecture. For example, the Parthenon is probably the best-known example of Athenian architecture. It is a building with several Corinthian columns that boasts zero right angles. I don't know how they did that or why it's important, but zero right angles. Another aspect of Greek culture that is celebrated today are the Olympic Games. Um, this was when city-states would pit their athletes against one another. Um, however, they were not regular considering that the city-states were often at war with one another and the Olympic Games were constantly interrupted. But I have a question for you. If Greece and their culture was so great and the biggest embodiment of Greece, Greek culture is Socrates, why did they kill him? It really makes you think. All right, anyways. Now, as when Alexander the Great take, takes over, there's uh, a cultural blending that occurs within the borders of the empire that he carves out. So you can see there on the map how big that empire was. You can see there's influences from the former Persian Empire, from Egypt, from the Indus Valley. So Alexander the Great supposedly is the person who inspired Chandragupta Maurya to start the Mauryan Empire. So he saw Alexander the Great riding on this horse with this big feather plume in his hat and all this wonderful blending of cultures that, uh, that embodied the awesomeness that was Greece. Anyways, this is known as Hellenistic culture. It's a blend of Greek, Egyptian, Persian, and Indian cultures. It's a result of Alexander's conquests, and it's something that occurs often in world history. When different cultures come together, they usually take things from one another to make new aspects of the culture, not go to war with one another, which is what many Americans would have you say today. Anyways, it lays the foundation for Roman culture, which is why the Romans are so heavily influenced by the Greeks. And we'll round this out with some economic stuff. Now, since the geography is uh, of Greece is mostly islands, uh, they're very good at seafaring, as we said, said before. Now, if we're talking about their uh, so soil, it's poor, unfertile, rocky. It's hilly. You can see from the topography right there. It's, it's really hard to find flat farmland in Greece. Therefore, they have a lot of like trees, which is why they grow nasty, nasty olives. But for the most part, uh, their economy relied upon the sea. They traded, they fished, they built ships. Now, this lack of fertile land caused them to go seek fertile land elsewhere, which is why they start to take over colonies. Remember thinking that they were egalitarian and nice to everybody? No. Now, let's wrap this up. The world in 500 BCE, so this is right before Greece really makes its rise. Look at that. That's what we have. Greece, the little itty bitty green thing over here. Persia, massive orange thing over here. So let's review this world in 500 BCE. Persia first. Persia was an empire and it was massive. It was really diverse. There were many different ethnicities and people from different cultural backgrounds. It collected taxes. It built roads, the Royal Road. They had a road called the Royal Road, pictured in red right there. They had Cyrus the Great. They were monotheistic. They outlawed slavery from time to time. And when it came to conquering people, they let the people continue their ways. Now the Greeks, they were split into a bunch of different city-states for most of the time. All of them were different. They weren't really that diverse unless somebody was a slave. They had no unified army, barely built any roads, were polytheistic, slavery was legal and practiced often and regularly. There was more than just Athens, and they colonized people and slaughtered populations. So that begs the question, where would you want to have wanted to live? Persia? 
or Greece. I'll leave the mic right there. This is your Buddha signing off. <laughs>